Hello and welcome to Lord of the Board. My name is Sam and today we are going to be looking at the debut title of Eerie Idol Games, The Old King's Crown. The Old King's Crown is a betting and bluffing, hand management, asymmetric lane battler board game where you are going to be trying to take the Old King's Crown as one of four heirs. Now this game has beautiful artwork and ever since I first saw it, that was the first thing that captured my attention about this game is just how gorgeous it is. And before we go any further into the game, I do want to say that this is still considered a prototype copy, so things are subject to change. Um, the artwork on some of the cards is subject to change. All of that is, is not final and also not even all the artwork is done. All these cards are going to have unique artwork, so there are still more beautiful pieces of artwork that we have not seen yet and I am just so excited to see those pieces of artwork but getting back to the game and what it presents let's talk about kind of the main argument of the game what is the story well the old king is gone maybe they were murdered maybe they ran off but now these four heirs are rising up to take the throne. We've got the nobility who is kind of trying to manipulate the court and trying to play a more defensive game in order to win. And then we've also got the clans who are really, really good at fighting in just one region at a time, but are really good at making sure that they win in that region that they want. You've got the uprising who are really good at working together. Um, they're kind of that slow rumbling sound under everyone's feet. They are the revolution. Then we've got the gathering who are kind of shot out into the dark forest and they are casting all of these rituals to summon these big gigantic mythic beasts uh, to eventually take over the throne and you as a player are going to be taking on one of these four heirs and factions in order to gain influence Now the game is going to repeat these phases and there are four phases in the game. There are spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Spring is basically when all the players are going to be placing their pieces onto the game's board. Now, if you look at the game board, there are going to be three different regions. There's going to be the highlands, the plateau, and the lowlands. And each of these regions actually has two locations. The highlands are mostly there in order to actually be able to place cards in unique areas like the court or also to your site of power, your unique faction site of power, which is a way to just access new locked cards. But then we've got in the plateau kind of the way to get the most influence if you win in there, but also a way to get a collaborator disc, which is basically just a new asymmetric ability that you can gain as your faction. And then in the lowlands, this is basically where you can get a lot of card cycling, um, hand management, and grabbing things out of the discard pile. So kind of some deck manipulation there you're gonna have a Herald and Companies. Now, the Herald is kind of a tool that you can use in order to either show that you want something or try to protect something that you actually want. Because where you place this, everybody in the game is going to be thinking, well, do they want that or are they trying to divert me from what they really want this round? But when you do actually win in the region where your Herald is and you choose to get the reward of the location that your Herald is at, you actually get an additional influence from there and you can steal an influence from all the other heralds in that location. So these heralds are really, really powerful, but you can use them in a couple different ways. But then you've also got companies that had plus one strength to the region when you place them in there. And so this phase is all about placing all those pieces on the board and kind of setting up for what is to come. All right, so then we move into summer, and this is where all of the cards are placed down at each of the regions. Every player has to place one card face down at each of the main three regions and may place a card face down at the Great Road at the bottom of the board. Now keep in mind the abilities of the cards that you're placing face down, the number matters, um, and some of the attributes as well really do matter. So as you're placing them, you gotta be thinking about what you really want to get done once you win or maybe you're trying to lose. Once every player has placed a card face down, we move to the autumn phase where the last player in turn order is going to be placing resolution markers at each of these regions, basically determining the order in which all of these regions get resolved. This matters a lot. This puts the last player in turn order in a really good position because they can kind of plan out some combos this way by having some cards be able to bolster up some of the later clashes that will happen. 
then we are going to basically resolve each of these three regions starting with one, two, and then three. And what you're gonna be looking at is you're gonna be flipping up the cards in that region and looking at who has the highest strength total. Now you're gonna be adding the strength of the card you had played, the companies in that region, as well as any other special effects that you may have via Kingdom Cards, which we'll get into in a little bit. But whoever at the end has the most strength in that region will win. And then that player is going to choose one of the two locations in the region in order to gain the reward shown on it. So for example, if I win in the Highlands region right here and I choose the castle as my reward, I'm gonna be gaining an influence and then I can move a card with authority that I already have revealed on the board to the court. Or I can play one out of my hand straight to the court. And that's my reward. Then once you do this for all three of the regions, we move to winter. If any players had placed a card face down by the great road, they are able to now reveal it up and whoever has the highest will start off by drafting these kingdom cards that are on the bottom of the board. Now, kingdom cards are very, very powerful abilities that are not necessarily fair. Some of them are much better than others and I think that's what really makes the game kind of shine in a way. You're gonna be revealing these and then drafting them in order from highest number to lowest number revealed. Now, these will actually be put into your player board and the card that you use to grab it will actually be protecting it. And in later rounds, when a player reveals a card, they can actually use it instead of grabbing a new kingdom card, they can steal one as long as they have a number that's higher than the one that you use to protect your card. So there's a lot of opportunity for take that during this winter phase as well. And then we move to the end of year where we clean up the board, we remove all the heralds, we remove the companies to the company reserve, and then you're gonna have to choose whether you're going to retire your cards or put them back into your discard pile. When you retire them, they go out of your deck cycle. And this game really does work with your deck in a very unique way. When you cycle through your deck and you're trying to draw cards and you can't draw any more, you actually hit a, an ability called attrition, which basically lowers your hand size down by one. So in this game, it is not good to cycle very quickly. You want to be conserving on your cards, but at the same time, you wanna let go of cards that you don't really need so that you get to the good cards quicker. So kind of balancing that is one of the main things that makes the game good. Then at the end, you're gonna check if anybody won the game. In a three through four player game, it's 15 influence. In a two player game, it's gonna be 20 influence. And you're gonna repeat from spring and go all the way through and keep doing that. By the way, in spring, it also determines the order track, which is basically player's turn order, and that's organized by whoever has the most influence to whoever has the least. So that's how it's gonna change who places those resolution markers each round. Now I do wanna take a little bit of time to talk about the factions. You know me, I love asymmetry in my games and I wanna to express to you how kind of unique these different factions really are. Every faction in the game is also going to be having four tactics cards and these tactics cards also give you special abilities, some that you can use in each of the different seasons and there is a part in the phase of every game where you can actually use your own actions in player turn order. So after the spring setup, you're also gonna be doing spring actions, you're gonna be doing the summer placing of cards and then you're going to be doing summer actions and so on. But these tactic styles all give your factions each very unique flavor. So let's start with the nobility. They are kind of like the ones that are really good at manipulating the court, like I was saying. So their house endures winter ability is one of my favorites, but they can add an additional card into the court, which is awesome ability because they can gain more influence from the court. Whereas typically all the factions in the game can only have one card, meaning they're gaining one influence. The nobility is better at gaining influence with the court and can have multiple cards in there. If you want a defensive focus faction, the nobility is going to be for you, it being able to lock off particular areas of the map, as well as using their wealth to secure assets from across the kingdom. Then we've got the clans. Now, if you like the idea of being the strongest in all of these clashes that are gonna be happening in the regions, if you wanna really be able to pack a hard punch, the clans are going to be the faction for you. 
They have a really, really cool card that has the ability of pillaging where they can deny rivals any rewards and gain extra resources by continuing to win in the region that you have that card with pillage. One of my favorite of their abilities is Startling Battle Cry, which is a really, really handy tool where they can, after a clash is resolved as a tie, you can actually win the clash even if it was tied. And that is an ability that has come up where it's been very, very useful in the game. And it can also be comboed with some really powerful kingdom cards that I've seen. All right, so let's talk about the Uprising or the Rebellion. They are the faction to play if you enjoy creating opportunities through card manipulation and control. You can get a large number of supporters and pick the perfect time to act with your spies and plots. You're really good at having a lot of different elements helping to overwhelm your opponents. So kind of like going wide in magic as opposed to going tall like the clan does. Now, one of my favorite abilities that they have is their ability to increase their hand size back up with Take the Power Back, where during any phase, they can increase their hand size by one if they remove a card that is in the court, if they eliminate at least one card using the Black Powder Poi, which is their decree card, or if they win all three regions in a round when you play School of the Streets, which are all cards in their deck. But I love this because they can actually increase to pretty high hand amounts, which is very, very unique to some of the other factions, which it's a lot more tough to do so. And then we get to my personal favorite, the Gathering. They are definitely the most weird one, and I think that's one of the reasons why I like them so much. Um, the Gathering is really, really good if you enjoy growing in power over time. It's not going to be quick, but you have to kind of build up your, your cards and work on setting up these rituals. As the game goes on, you will be able to slowly take away your opponent's pools of followers and influence, and all the while you're going to be sacrificing your own in order Order to get new, more powerful cards. They're probably the faction that is most heavy on questing because their whole side of power is like a legit side quest where they're trying to basically awaken this great beast, which is the strongest card in the game. And it takes a little bit of time, but once it happens, it's a really, really cool storytelling moment for everybody. My favorite of their tactics are actually a, a twofold. They've got two rituals as tactic cards, one that is an autumn and one that is a winter. One is the ritual of the tooth and one is the ritual of the eye, and these are both opportunities opportunities to add new cards to their deck, but they both take time to activate and have very particular quest patterns. Like one of them you're trying to lose in every single region in order to add an influence on there. And then once you get three influence on there, you're actually able to get the cards. So you're gonna be playing a very interesting game and players won't really know what you're trying to do, whether you're trying to win in regions or lose in regions to try and activate those rituals. The best way that I can describe it is that it almost feels like a TCG in a way. It's a game that feels like it rewards players for doing clever card play. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people like trading card games. The thing that I like though that it kind of expands on is the fact that your deck building is really nothing like anything I've seen before. It's it's such a weird concept where you don't want to go through your deck too quick because then you're going to be lowering your total hand size. But at the same time, you want to get rid of cards for good. That way you can get to the good cards that you need quicker. And kind of going to the lowlands regions, like I was saying, where you can you know, grab three cards out of your discard pile, or you can put cards at the bottom of your draw deck. Like there are some ways to manipulate and lengthen uh, your hand size in order to not really get hurt by attrition. So there, there is a lot going on in how you manipulate your hand and what cards you're playing, what cards you're, you're, you're sending out. Um, and retiring essentially. The game definitely rewards people that are good at planning what they think will happen. And as you play each of the different four factions in the game, you start to learn some of the more commonly known strategies of each faction. And therefore you can literally play against your opponents. 
every faction has a five value card that essentially will eliminate one card from each of their opponents unless a shield card is revealed, then they are removed. And so you can play around that as well. All of these cards have those interactions where you're like, oh, I could play this and totally win, but what if my opponent's know that I'm going to play that and then they counter me. So then you're thinking, okay, well now they think that I'm going to play this. So I'm going to play something else. Or do they think that I'm going to do that? So maybe I'll just go with my original plan. <laughs> and those are like the crazy thoughts. Like once you know your friends or once you know um, your family, whoever you're playing with, once you know how they think, you can start going back and forth between what the potential of what they're going to do is. I think that's where the game's fun is most at right there. Now, the other thing is the asymmetry in the game. It's actually a lot more asymmetric than you would think. Um, with how easy it is to learn one faction and then learn the next, the tactics tiles are all very, very different. Um, besides the ambush, which is pretty much every faction has that one, but the other three are unique to each faction and are really thematic to each faction as well. That on top of the decree cards being unique, on top of you having special cards that you can gain from your side of power and when you're questing with your cards, those are unique. The biggest thing that's going to take a little bit of time for your play group is learning all of the keyword reference because this is a whole list of keywords that the cards could potentially have and kind of as you start playing the game, you're going to just learn these and they will make, they, they make a lot of sense, but the first couple plays, there's going to be a lot of going back to this and checking what exactly things do. Like quest cards can go to the site of power, authority cards can go to the court, eliminate, you can eliminate a certain type of card, deploy, you can place this card in the winter time in order to add that strength to the first clash in that region for the next round. So there's just like a lot of different keywords. And once you learn all of those, once you've played every faction, I think this game has the potential to be a lot of people's favorite game of all time because it rewards that multiple play. This is the type of game that I enjoy because I love games where I don't just play it once and I want to set it aside on the table. I want to explore every aspect of this game and I want to play it with as many people as I can so that I can figure out how they play the game, how they see the puzzle. But. Guys, that is it for the old King's Crown. Um, I would love it if you guys would check out the campaign. I've got the link down below. So if you are interested in this game, if you want to check it out, definitely follow that link down there. Thank you so much to Eerie Idol Games for sending over this copy for me to show off to you guys. But hey, that is it for the video. Let's go ahead and drop the beat.